Well, greetings to all you tube junkies out there in YouTube land, and welcome to one of the more unusual videos that I've ever posted. This all began when I became interested in these oil can delay and echo units that are becoming so popular. Uh, I actually bid on a couple of them on eBay and got outbid uh, both times, but a very generous viewer had rescued one from a trash heap. Okay, it was all disassembled and had not worked in ages, uh, but it was reasonably complete. And since he was not going to do anything with it, he sent it to me so that I could fully restore it and uh, then test it and make a video of the process uh, for all of you. This is the finished device that you see before you now, and uh, over the next half hour or so, we're going to go through step by step how it was completely restored and reassembled and rewired and put back into working condition. And one thing I'm going to tell you is nothing I've ever heard can make some of the spookiest sounds uh, that this thing can. Okay, it's like being back in a 1950s uh, science fiction movie. Okay, it's absolutely great. I, I, no matter whether you like these devices or not, I really think you're going to get a kick out of the uh, sound demos and then finally uh, to hear it uh, played uh, with a guitar. Before we get started, why don't we just have a real quick historical review. Uh, these uh, devices, and there are a bunch of different ones. This is a super organ tone. There are about 12 or 15 different types, and they have, some of them are just like slap back uh, delay units, echo units. This one says organ tone, and uh, I think when you hear the guitar demo, you'll see where they get that from. But it also has a very pronounced reverb and tremolo effect which I know Jack thoroughly enjoys. The whole oil can uh, concept was invented by a fellow named Ray Lubeau, and it relies on a, a rotating disc of anodized aluminum that's coated with a suspension of carbon particles. Then neoprene heads will write on the disc by creating an electrostatic charge in those car carbon particles. These written messages are then read by another set of neoprene heads and uh, combined with the original signal uh, to produce some really incredible effects. The key to all of this is a very special type of oil uh, which is used to coat the disc and preserve the electrostatic charge that's stored in the carbon particles on the disk surface uh, to keep that charge from dissipating into the air. Also, it lubricates the disk so that the constant running with the rubber heads uh, against it uh, don't wear through the anodizing and destroy it. So without further ado, uh, let's watch as a semi-basket case super organ tone uh, is converted into the finished device you see before you. I removed one of the two lids from the can and as you can see inside there's a lot of what looks like rust and corrosion and a very strong smell of brake fluid which is never a good sign. However if you look in there at the disc right down here it appears to be almost flawless so let's keep our fingers crossed. Okay, here's the small motor pulley, uh, which works fine. I plugged in the two AC wires for the motor, and it spins smoothly and quietly. And this is the pulley for the recording and uh, reading wheel that's inside the drum over here. I think you can see it spinning. And it seems to have some resistance, probably due to really dirty bearings that are passing through to get into the can so uh, I may have to disassemble this from the shaft and try to clean those bearings. This is kind of an interesting touch right here. It's a spring-loaded arm with rubber uh, grommets that hold it really tight to the shaft so that as the shaft turns the spring will cause resistance periodically and make the speed waver which will give you sort of a tremolo or vibrato effect to the tone. 
Now this is apparently an early version that does not have the arm out here that pushes the uh, drive wheel back and forth to engage and disengage the rubber uh, little uh, record and uh, reed heads inside the can. Uh, hopefully everything will still work just fine. There's electrical um, adjustments here, pots, and different things that mount on the face plate. Also, and this is kind of worrisome, is there's one broken shielded wire. Now it can reach all over the place in here and I have no idea exactly where it's supposed to go. This is my own shield. As uh, this unit came to me, it had one 12AX7 and an empty tube uh, socket. And then if you look down here, of course, the way it always is, the identification of this tube is obliterated. I've been told it's probably a 12AU7, but then a lot of these devices use two 12AX7, so I'll have to do some more checking. If we look underneath at the circuitry within the chassis, you can see it's fairly elaborate. And it also looks like it hasn't been messed with at all. It looks original. Those look like period resistors and capacitors. And uh, for that reason, uh, this part may be in really good original. You can see that the chassis sits upon this tin base plate with a piece of uh, insulating cardboard here, apparently uh, out of concern for some parts right around here that may arc although this isn't grounded uh, so it's 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 questionable maybe uh, you could get an electric shock or something like that and this provides insulation you can look down into the uh, area here where the motor is and the shaft for the read write wheel uh, you can see how dirty it is down on the bottom there uh, it, my nature is that I want to take this completely apart and clean it all up put it back together like a new one but then again, um, you know, sometimes you can mess things up that weren't in bad shape to begin with. Notice the can here just looks like an old can of beans. And it's got lids on both sides. So what I'm going to try to do is pry this lid off here so that the can itself, the body of the can, can be removed. And then we'll expose all of the interior parts for cleaning and, and checking wiring and things of that sort. As you can see, the faceplate's in pretty good shape. It's not dented. Uh, I stupidly put a piece of tape on it up here, and when I removed the tape, uh, some of the paint came with it, so I touched that up, and then I waxed the plate. So uh, that part's in really good shape. Now this is the front of the cabinet. You can see that the faceplate slopes uh, back in at the top a little bit. Uh, this is the top, and those of you who know me well will know how much I love to see the white paint spots on top of any amplifier or uh, amplifier related device. So this is a mark of exceptional originality and quality. And I don't think any spider made these spots unless it was one with uh, a bad case of diarrhea. This really looks to me like white ceiling paint. Then we look in to the floor here and everything looks like it's in pretty good shape except that these pieces here that were the cleats where the back door would attach uh, are broken loose. Also the back door itself is missing. Uh, as we'll see in some pictures, there's a uh, aluminum strap across the back and then you wind the cord around that and it has some nice little metal tags here and there. I have none of that so I will build a back door with the aluminum strap and hope to God I can turn up some nice little tags if possible. Underneath, pretty slick, uh, it's got nice rubber feet and corner protectors. These are the screws that were holding the chassis in place. And there you go. So, uh, let's get started We're trying to remove the body of the can and maybe bead blast the interior to clean Okay, this is quite a touchy process. I'm starting uh, and I'm prying all the way around and then going further down on the sides if I can, but you have to be very careful that you don't deform the lid or the body of the can so that it doesn't seal back together properly. Now to get the body of the can off of the uh, disc and read write heads, 
I had to remove that portion of the mechanism from the base plate and now I'll be able to maneuver the uh, body of the can and remove it. So the body of the can is removed and as you can see it uh, is kind of a rusty mess uh, which is going to require a lot of cleaning and also now we can get a much better view here of the disc and the read write heads. There's three of them. One, two, three of the heads and the rubber parts seem to be in really good shape. Uh, I'll need to check them but look at the surface of the disc. It looks just smooth smooth as can be. Okay so maybe I got lucky and maybe this disc is indeed salvageable. Also look on the body here that what the corrosion has done. What a mess. Uh, this part may need to be uh, be blasted also. Okay let's take a quick look here at the before cleanup on the can and in just a second or two we're gonna see the after. Okay here's the interior of the can now that it's been uh, media blasted and polished I think it would just about pass for new. Next step is to undo the four screws that hold this upper plate to the lower. Uh, undo each of the nuts which hold the rubber heads in place and then lift off this filthy corroded piece and uh, media blast it. Well here's a close-up of one of the mysterious heads in this unit. Uh, as you can see it's just a square piece of a fairly thick rubber uh, which is uh, looks like it's stapled to this plate and then a wire is soldered from that plate uh, and comes around to uh, this uh, soldered uh, position right here on the inner can lid. Now with the removal of the uh, heads you can see the magic disc and it has a kind of an iridescence to it almost like a CD does um, or DVD. Kind of interesting, sort of almost a pearlescent iridescence. Now as you can see the nut holding the disc to the shaft is a corroded mess. Uh, I'm going to really keep my fingers crossed about being able to unscrew this. It's also interesting to note that the moment that I moved the wires that connected the heads uh, to these uh, terminals all three of them broke instantly. So you can see just how fragile these wires are and why it's uh, important in a corroded one like this to replace them. Next while uh, locked onto this nut with a socket wrench I work this pulley off the end. Uh, you notice the dates. This is probably the last time this thing was serviced. What is that? 68, 69? Um, this pulley is amazingly heavy. It's uh, just solid steel it feels like or cast metal of some sort. Uh, probably the weight is to provide a flywheel effect to maintain a uniform uh, speed of rotation. Now we're going to pop off a little circlip from right there in that ring and then pull off what in this one is four fibrous shims to exactly space the shaft uh, from left to right so that the disc has the right position relative to the rubber heads. Now when I spin that shaft you'll see the run out. See how the tip of the shaft makes a circular motion? It isn't uh, exactly pivoting on one point but it's going around in a circle. There is some run out. This has been bent at some time or other very slightly but it is bent and it sh must be straightened. Okay I'm still having a terrible time with this uh, frozen knot here so what I'm going to do is come over to this side and I removed the nuts and screws that are holding this wall on and see if I can't uh, extract the uh, disc going that way. Alright now I've removed that side wall here from the motor box. Uh, you can see that the uh, bushing there for the uh, drive shaft is in pretty good shape. Looks fine. Um, and actually this is all fairly clean. So I'll just clean this 
uh, using uh, like some detergents or something like that and then uh, set it aside. Now I just remove this rear nut and lift the motor right out of this uh, the little metal box here. Now my efforts to try to push the uh, shaft that drives the record disc through from this side are being thwarted because it seems like the bushing may be seized on the shaft or else all this gunk here is preventing that bushing uh, from allowing the shaft to slide through. Well hallelujah, using device grips on the shaft on this side in an area where uh, a few little scratches don't matter and the socket on this side I managed to get the nut uh, off that holds the disc to the shaft. Sadly now that a steel washer or whatever that is spacer is frozen to the shaft. Okay I finally managed to extract the shaft and uh, magic disc from the uh, unit. Uh, what was holding it up was that this bushing that the, that the shaft passes through right behind here had seized to the shaft quite tightly and would not allow the shaft to move outward. But uh, with a little bit of persuasion uh, I changed its mind and was able to extract the shaft without hurting the disc or the shaft. Now because uh, removal of the shaft required that this bushing come out of the bushing holder I've had to uh, repair it and then rivet the bushing back into its holder. Okay, now let's see what we can do with uh, these hideous, rusted, and corroded parts. Well, and here are those hideous, corroded parts, all media blasted and looking pretty much like new. They'll make perfect electrical contact. All the threads are clean. They should go together well. Notice the solder. Um, terminals here will be a whole lot easier to solder to now. Remember that rusty lid? I thought they came out pretty well. Well the final and scariest part uh, went well. Uh, I got these uh, washers and bushings off of the front of the disc and then was able to pull this rusted corroded uh, rear support disc out. Uh, I coated this with tape to protect it and I think it's going to come out of this uh, just perfect. Okay so now it's time to media blast this hideous thing. And there it is. A little cleaner than it was. Okay, so now everything ought to go back together pretty much like new. Uh, and uh, the connections uh, soldered to nice clean metal should hold well. So I guess that's about it for disassembly. Now let's pray I can get it all back together. Okay, now it's time for reassembly. We take this bracket and uh, slide the phenolic spacers down on the, the two long screws and uh, sandwich the rubber oil seal between it and the can lid. Then on the other side we uh, uh, install the bearing race with the oil hole up and then gently tighten the nuts down in rotation back forth back forth. Uh, not over tight just enough to secure the bracket against the oil seal so that it can't move around. Okay, now I'm going to chuck about uh, one inch of the tip of the drive shaft into my drill press and then put a piece of wood down here uh, so that we can watch the tip. I'm going to turn on the drill. See that run out? That's not acceptable. We want this thing to rotate so that instead of the tip ascribing a circle, it ascribes a point. So what I'm going to do now is determine each time that it swings in a particular direction like right now it's over to the right. I'm going to gently bend it back to the left and keep testing it until I get it to run true. Okay, here it is running at speed and as you can see the tip is stationary. Now it's time to polish up the magic irreplaceable uh, disc with a microfiber cloth. I cleaned the center of it the best I could. Uh, really the area we're concerned about is between right here and out here because those rubber uh, read and write heads are going to be writing out in this area. So this sort of like an album with the label at the center and then the record grooves and then the lead-in edge. We're really concerned about 
this region right here and it looks perfect on this disc. Now using a heat sink to protect the rubber I've soldered a fresh piece of wire to each of the rubber heads. The old wire is just a mess. It's all corroded and just not usable. Now it's time to install the record and playback heads on their support disc. Uh, I started out calling this number one, number two, number three. Okay, going counterclockwise. Now look, the number one rubber is the widest, number two is medium, and number three is the thinnest. Also notice that the rubber is laying back so that looking from beneath the disc it would be rotating counterclockwise so this would lay back as the disc went by. You can adjust how deep or shallow the uh, head is with respect to the disc and uh, I found that if you look at the metal right behind the rubber of the head and measure to the bottom of the disc, the far side of the disc, it's exactly 19.5 millimeters from up here to down here and that's on all three of them. So you adjust it, you get your angle right so that it agrees with the uh, grooves on the disc it's not pointing out this way or in here but uh, tracking properly and you have the proper depth adjustment 19.5 millimeters from here up to the top of the metal. Now the very clean and fragile disc has been slid down onto the shaft and then securely tightened with a socket wrench so that it can't spin. Now to, to give support to this end of the shaft with the uh, disc on it, uh, I installed this wall with the uh, bearing for the shaft so that now it can spin to smooth as can be and it's properly supported. Next we're going to install the disc that has the rubber uh, record and playback heads. The three heads connected to their mounting disc have been installed with the four screws holding them in place and the wire from each head has been connected to the appropriate insulated terminal and the can lid which passes through and comes out here and now the wires from the uh, chassis will come and connect to each of them. Now after applying a very light application of oil to this ring on the lower cap then I use C-clamps very gently to go all the way around the perimeter and press the body of the can into place so that it's uptight against this surface. Be sure to use a piece of aluminum or something else to protect the top edge of the can from being deformed by your C-clamp. But just keep clamping all the way around gently until you get a nice snug fit between the body of the can and that surface. Okay, now check to be sure that you have a nice firm fit, that that uh, inner cap is on tight. Then uh, we'll look inside to be sure that none of our wires are touching the spinning disc or uh, are pinched anywhere in the unit. You'll also notice how low the spinning disc fits in the can. That's so it can scavenge uh, oil from the bottom of the can with and not require a great amount of oil, just a couple teaspoonfuls, and the disc can pick it up uh, down here in what amounts to the oil pan of the can. Now we'll remove the screws that temporarily held the sidewall in place. We'll remove the slide wall and install the motor into the inner side here of the side wall. Now with the motor securely installed to this plate and oiled, be sure you oil uh, both sides of the uh, armature uh, because it's a whole lot easier to do with the motor out than with it in. Okay, we're going to slide it into place and reinstall those two lower screws. Then you reinstall those four fiber shims and the uh, circlip 
on your uh, motor draw shaft and now it's time to install the big pulley. Okay, I install that vibrato uh, pressure adjusting arm that is sort of unique to this unit since it's an early one and I also installed the pulley on the drive shaft. Uh, it was a little loose, it tended to want to spin, so I put a tiny bit of super glue into the space between the axle and the pulley and now it's on uh, for keeps. Now if I ever do choose to remove the pulley, all I'll have to do is put a soldering iron in here and heat up that junction so that the super glue then will be dissolved and I can just remove the pulley easily. Now just to verify that everything's moving smoothly, uh, I uh, put a flat rubber band around the motor pulley and the big drive pulley and I've got it running. It's very smooth, completely quiet. Uh, I think we have a successful rebuild, at least as far as this goes. I'm not sure about the electrical part yet. Let's have an update here on the mighty Telray Super Organ Tone. I have the oil can unit all finished and I put in uh, several cc's of the Yukon LB65 lubricant. It's a real thin oil. Uh, I was told it was 65 weight. Well, it's nowhere near that. It's like about 5 weight oil. And you can see I didn't put much in. But you have just enough in here to 
uh, cover the bottom of the disc that's in the back there about an eighth of an inch of the disc is immersed in the oil down in the bottom of the can. Let's start off by looking at the instrument input. Now it can be of normal strength or a particularly high level input would have to be attenuated a bit by this uh, potentiometer to reduce its strength so that it won't overdrive the system. Uh, the two different inputs then meet right here and come over and are fed to the uh, grid of the first triode. Now this can be either 12AX7 or 12AU7. Output from the plate and at this point it has two places to go. It can come down here through the uh, direct signal volume control and go over here you see where it says A. We'll drop down here to A and it will go to the output. So the dry signal then comes in, goes through one stage of amplification, uh, has its uh, strength of its signal attenuated right here, and then goes straight out to the amplifier. Now depending on the position of this potentiometer offering more or less resistance to that shortcut to the output, uh, the signal may be deflected in this direction and come over to a second stage of amplification. Another triode here of a 12AX7 or 12AU7 and then it can be output to the top uh, right head. Now that is number two and uh, as you have seen by looking at the device that would be the middle of those three um, lugs that were on that disc that I soldered the wires to. So uh, after two stages of amplification uh, it will be fed to the, this head and be written, the signal will be written on the disc. Now the method of writing is not the type of magnetic storage that we're accustomed to on the ferromagnetic reel-to-reel uh, <clears throat> -reel, uh, tape or videotape. Instead, it's stored uh, as an electrostatic signal on, uh, in the little tiny carbon granules that are present on the surface of the anodized aluminum disc. This electrostatic message will then continue uh, around on the spinning disc to be picked up by the reed head. And it should be noted that it is picked up more than once because each time the disc spins, some of the message will be picked up until the message itself finally dissipates from the surface of the disc. Now the message that was written here by this head will spin around on the disc and be picked up here by the reed head, this one right here. Uh, the signal then, uh, the capacitance signal will be read from the disc, fed into uh, the uh, grid of another triode of a 12AX7 or 12AU7, and then can pass down this direction and come out to the amplifier. So this would be the first echo that you would hear is when this reed head picks up the signal that was written by the right head. Now the portion of the reed head signal that did not go uh, straight out here to the amplifier can continue along this way and be fed in to the grid of another 12AX7 or 12AU7 triode and can be fed to the bottom right head which is over here number three and be written again on the disc. So you see we have very complex writing that's going on. We're having this written signal come around and be read and then re-recorded over here. So we have this delay and we have the delay between these two points. So as the reed head is picking up the signals of various delay, we're getting that, that echo effect that uh, actually does not diminish that quickly. It has a, a, a long uh, persistence of echo as the disc is spinning. And finally, as you will see when we go through the adjustment of this circuit, there are all sorts of fine-tuning adjustments that can be made. 
Uh, there is a write volume pot here which controls the strength of signal sent to both of the write heads. Uh, there is a organ tone level um, signal right here which uh, controls the intensity of the first read head uh, signal and uh, all different ways that it really has to be balanced for optimum uh, performance. And uh, we will demonstrate that and I think you'll see how these controls work. Now as previously mentioned, the electrostatic signals being stored on the disk would quickly dissipate into the air, in fact probably in a matter of a few milliseconds, if they, uh, the little carbon granules containing the signal and the surface of the disk was not coated with that U65 U union carbide oil. Okay, that then preserves the uh, signal on the surface of the disk and it also lubricates between those neoprene heads that are rubbing on the surface of the disk and the disk itself uh, so that a wear does not occur. Uh, you can imagine if this disc were spinning dry against those rubber heads uh, that eventually uh, the heads would be able to wear through the anodized coating and the carbon granules and the disc would be ruined. Then for safety's sake I installed a three wire power cord uh, with a bolted down chassis ground and a jumper between the chassis and the motor unit so that everything then uh, is safely grounded. I tested all the electrolytic capacitors including the filter caps here and the SR values were all quite low uh, which indicated to me that at some time in the not so distant past they had been replaced. I installed a fuse where a fuse uh, did not previously exist. There was already a hole right here in the chassis. I opened it up a little bit and installed a fuse holder, holder that you can uh, gain access to from the rear of the unit. Um, at the moment I have a 12AX7 and a 12AU7 uh, in place. Uh, we'll see how it sounds with uh, that tube complement and then I'll go with two 12AX7s to see if a little added gain uh, in, improves the overall quality of the uh, effect. Okay, so everything's upside down here and ready to go. I've got the trusty signal generator here uh, at about 100 cycles per second and we can dial uh, different frequencies here quite easily and I have a output that's going into where the guitar or instrument input would be fed into the unit. Okay then where it says amplifier that's the output it's going to come over here to a little uh, Fender bullet amp that I'm going to use uh, just for test purposes. Okay I have the motor unit now running I'm using just a large a rubber band uh, for the drive belt at the moment, it, although it seems to work quite well. It's dead quiet and nice and smooth. I have the uh, wiring for the motor on a separate AC line so I can plug it in back here to the current limiter. Um, and the uh, unit, uh, the uh, organ tone unit, has its own three wire power cord that's also plugged in back here at the current limiter. Okay, let's turn on the electronic portion of the organ tone unit and I think you're going to hear now our 100 cycle tone. Now listen when I uh, go to uh, higher frequencies. at about half effect. Let's crank it up higher. Wow. Pretty neat, huh? 
Now I've installed a little device that makes the wheel kind of wobble and vary in speed. Let's see how that sounds. Here's a quick view of the unit all assembled on its board with its faceplate. Uh, I'm going to have to get a chicken head knob, I guess, to replace that knob so they match. And you'll see besides all the controls on the front, there's also two pots that are accessible from the rear. This uh, is the right volume, which uh, would control uh, the volume of the effect. And down here is uh, what you could call the dry signal volume. So this is the way you make your balance between the dry signal and the effect signal. I have installed a couple small O-rings here to drive uh, the uh, large pulley. This is the wobbling effect to enhance the vibrato. And you see motor can and chassis are all happily nestled on the base board. I still need a, a tube shield for the 12AU7 or 12AX7, whichever ends up in this position. Okay, time for a demonstration of the right uh, pot effect on the sound. Uh, I'm going to crank it up. Uh, I have the right turned all the way down so all you're going to hear now is the uh, frequency generator sort of a straight dry signal you can definitely hear the effect that it has that's it pretty close to max now let's alter the dry signal volume. I think that's a pretty good compromise there. They're pretty well balanced.
what about does it on this rather lengthy video on the magnificent Telray Super Organ Tone. Before we go, I wanted to show you what the back looks like with the new back door and the bracket uh, for wrapping the cord. As you can see, it leaves plenty of room here for the heat that's generated uh, both by the motor and the electronic equipment to vent. And I've got this uh, kind of extended bracket here so I can wrap up the power cord. And although I did remove those two big white paint spots from the top, I left enough small paint spots for it to maintain its credibility. Now I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to Randy, who donated this device uh, to us so that the video could be made. Also to all the uh, Patreon patrons and PayPal contributors uh, who have kept us on the air for another month and advertising free. If you would like to join them, please check the links that I've posted in the video description, which will enable you to do so. I also will place a link in the video description uh, to a video by one of our viewers who is an expert in all of the Telray and other oil can devices. I think you'll find uh, his video to be very, very interesting, so check it out if you get a chance. Meanwhile, uh, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in our next video. Bye for now.